uh, the, the day we were sworn in. When I got done as speaker after my speech, and I spent about I spent I think about a forty an hour in the house floor, I left. I had other things to do. I did not go back to the house floor until two fifteen in the morning. And for fourteen hours, it just worked. Why did it work? Because of this book. That's how powerful I think this book is. This is a book I refer to again and again and again. It's the first book I ask all of my members and all the senior staff to read. Not all of them have done it yet. I'll start reminding them in the near future because I can tell when they haven't done it. Now you may say to yourself, how can you tell when they haven't done it? There's a section in here which talks about effective decisions. It's chapter 7. And I'm deliberately just going to jump around because I just want to take illustrations because this I would have to teach for three two-hour sessions to carry you through this book in detail. And I don't want people to get the Cliff Notes version. Newt thought these were the six big points. Every page of this book is incredible. If you will read it and then stop and say, OK, what did that mean in my life? How do I change my behavior? He says in here on effective decisions that um, you have to look for disagreement. I'm trying to find the exact reference here. Um, Somebody may want to help me for a second. But he talks about the notion that, that uh, you're always looking for uh, an argument or a disagreement. And he, and he cites the fact that Alfred Sloan would often say, if everybody agreed instantly, he'd say, let's postpone this decision for a week so we have the time to find something to disagree about. Because he wanted people to slow down and talk through the decision. He wanted to make sure that everybody in the room understood the decision. Because if you just say yes, and then later you realize, oh, that means you're cutting my department 30%. He doesn't want, want you to make the decision until you understand the decision. So when I watch my chairman, if they rush something through, they haven't gotten Drucker yet. Because they're missing. You want to cultivate all the disagreements before you decide. He has a section in here on, on uh, I think, I, I think that particular reference is in the, in the elements of decision making. He has a section in here in which he talks about building on strength. And I've, I've always vividly thought about this because it's one of the great weaknesses of modern management and it drives some of my associates crazy because they don't understand a particular style that Drucker emphasizes and that he says flatly came out of both George Marshall and Alfred Sloan. Now what does building on strength mean? Drucker's argument is real simple. He says, if you want a mountain, guess what you got on both sides of it? Huh? You have valleys. If you want a plateau, you don't have a mountain. What is modern management? What do modern human resource vice presidents look for? We're not going to hire you because of we found valley A or we found valley B. So you don't fit. You get enormous achievement in life if you focus on managing this. If you recruit strength. Why can I delegate and walk off? Because all around me there are people as powerful as Dick Armey and Tom DeLay and John Kasich and Nancy Johnson and Susan Mullinary. And they're all, they all have, now, does every one of them have a downside? Of course. As some of you probably have noticed, so do I. And you'll notice, I never worry about the valleys. I knew when I said I teach a 20-hour course after becoming speaker that some idiot would deliberately distort what I said. So when we had the giraffe comment totally taken out of context, that's just one of the valleys. You can't go mountain climbing unless you're willing to have valleys. But if you assemble a team, and this is one of the, if you look at George Marshall and you look at Alfred Sloan, remember what, what Drucker says. Sloan would spend weeks thinking about personnel. He'd really try to be concerned. Now, this book is so important, we're going to come back to it two more times. And, and I beg all of you, read it, mark it up, think it through, come in with questions next week. We may even get to it a third, uh, another time. We're certainly going to get to it next week on, on uh, Entrepreneurial Free Enterprise, and we're going to get it to it the last week when we're talking about citizenship. So mark it up, look for questions, look for things you don't understand, things you don't agree with. But we're not going to try to build any Chiron out of this. We're not going to say, here are the three big ones. Every page of this, if you read it and think about it and study it, this was a work of genius. This is, Drucker is, I believe, one of the great men of the 20th century. 
And this was an extraordinary effort on his part to lay out the lessons he'd learned when he wrote this. He'd, he was all, already uh, in, in late middle age. And, and, and so this is a book I wish every American citizen would someday read and understand its implication, which is you are powerful. You're a free person in a free society at the beginning of the information age, and you have resources and capacities un that no king in the ancient world had. Every citizen has opportunity if we can figure out how to make that true and how to get them to learn. Now, having said that, let me also suggest to you that you've got to reestablish as part of that heroes. Notice that uh, heroism teaches the values to be lived for. If you'll notice, Drucker, in a sense, talks about heroes. Alfred Sloan's extraordinary achievement in building the greatest industrial corporation in history. Truly one of the great studies. And Sloan's two works, My Adventures as a, uh, a White Collar Man, and, which is his earlier memoir written just before World War II, and uh, My Years with General Motors, are extraordinary books, well worth your reading. But Sloan is a great man. George Marshall may well be uh, the most, certainly the most disciplined and maybe in some ways the greatest American of the 20th century. Um, he built the modern army from 200, 170,000 men to 15 million in three years. It's one of the greatest leadership achievements in the history of the human race. And he was a man of such nobility that he rivals Washington in our lexicon of people who are truly noble. Theodore Vell created the modern telephone company, avoided nationaliz nationalization, which was the current thing. But, but the whole concept, in, in your book of readings today, Building a Community of Citizens, uh, Don Everly is the editor, the section by Dennis Denenberg on the role of heroes and heroines in the American story makes a very important point. And that is that when you are surrounded by heroes and heroines, when the pictures on the wall of your school are the pictures of real achievement, when you grow up thinking you know, that you could be like Helen Keller, you could be like Clara Barton, you could be like Eleanor Roosevelt, you could, you could lead a life that is dynamic and exciting. You could do things that are real. It's different than when you grow up without the, because, because they, in a sense, what her heroes and heroines do is they remind us that there are mountaintops and the humans get there. And that you two, not, not that you'll necessarily get there. Uh, Drucker says at one point, you're not necessarily ever going to be able to, to, to write like Mozart, but you can learn to play like Mozart. 